Special thanks to Horizon Therapeutics for sponsoring today's Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. Working tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics' mission at horizontherapeutics.com. Our major concern really has been since this time up into 2013, our daughter and her care. You know, we're caring for somebody with spina bifida and, and hydrocephalus. And then our son starts to develop these really odd, there's these really odd occurrences. She's having seizures and it, I just didn't know what they were. We didn't know what they were. They just started off small and then they just started happening more, more frequently. That's our guest this week, Felamon Hernandez. Felamon is a designer and photographer. He and his wife, Cecilia, have three children, including eight-year-old twins, Lalo, who has epilepsy, and Adelina, who has spina bifida. We'll hear Felamon's story and how he and his family have cared for the twins. That's all on this special Father's Network Dad to Dad podcast. Say hello to David Hirsch. Hi, and thanks for listening to the Dad to Dad podcast, Fathers Mentoring Fathers of Children with Special Needs, presented by the Special Fathers Network. The Special Fathers Network is a dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children connect with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we'd be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group. Please go to Facebook.com groups and search Dad to Dad. And now, let's listen in on this conversation between Felamon Hernandez and David Hirsch. I'm thrilled to be talking today with Felamon Hernandez of Olympia, Washington, who's a father of three, a graphic designer and a photographer. Felamon, thank you for taking the time to do a podcast interview for the Special Fathers Network. Thank you for having me, David. I really appreciate the time. You and your wife, Cecilia, have been married for 13 years and the proud parents of three children, son Emil, 10, and eight-year-old twins. Adelina, who was diagnosed in vitro with spina bifida, and brother Lalo, who is plagued by seizures. Let's start with some background. Where did you grow up? Tell me something about your family. I actually was born in Austin, Texas. About a year after I was born, my parents moved us to Fairbanks, Alaska. We spent about five years in Fairbanks. And uh, after that, my family moved back down to Austin. Since then, I had been in Austin for for school and then eventually in in college at the University of Texas. I I grew up in both Alaska and and pretty much Texas for a lot of my my youth. Okay. So uh, out of curiosity, what did your dad do for a living? Well, primarily he's worked for most of his working life with airlines. So when we were up in Alaska, he worked for, I think, one or two different airline, airline companies. Yeah, so he was pretty much working for airlines throughout most of his career. Great. So how would you describe your relationship with your dad? You know, for, for a number of years, you know, he had to work away from the home. So, you know, he, he was out a lot. But for the most part, it was, a, it was a good relationship. I mean, he was kind of a one of those strong, quiet dads. So very respectful. That's where I kind of learned how to be, to show respect for, you know, the opposite sex and and just be kind and, and gentle. He really learned that from him. And he really, you know, honestly, really taught us to, to care a lot. So, um, he, no, a caring man, a uh, hard worker, very hard worker. So, Yeah, well, if I can paraphrase what you've said, it sounds like he's had a good work ethic, more by example than by word, right, as far as uh, setting an example. And, uh, you know, he's uh, family-oriented, right? Yeah. And I'm wondering when you think about your dad, if there's one or two takeaways that come to mind, something that you're like, this is what I think of when I think of my dad or something you're trying to replicate yourself as a dad. Yeah, no, um, just thinking about my dad and, and no, he, he was a strong willed, he is a strong willed man and quiet guy and just a hard worker. I just, when I think about him, I mostly think about how much of a hard worker he was, especially when, you know, coming up as a, as a youngster. Okay. And uh, from what I remember, your grandfather's died at a relatively early age, so they weren't involved. And I'm wondering, was there any other father figure, father figures, other men that, you know, played an influential role in your life as a young person or maybe as a young adult for that matter? 
No, yeah, I have been thinking about this for a bit since our last conversation. And, and one of the things that really came up for me was my background in music. I don't know how much I expressed, but, you know, growing up, I actually wanted to be like a, a music major. And when actually when I was in middle school, my first band conductor ended up being my first uh, prevalescent teacher. He played saxophone and that was kind of an easy, um, easy way in to get, get my, my band conductor to give, give me private lessons also. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing. And did I hear you say that you played the saxophone or was it a different instrument that you played? You know, that's correct. It was the saxophone. It was, uh, I would, I'm not sure I would say I was very good, but it, it got me into university. So. so from what I remember, you went to the University of Texas at Austin and you were a music major. Yeah, correct. I, I was a music major and then I switched while I was at the University of Texas at Austin and into government. After all that was said and done, I tried to take the LSAT a couple of times and apply for a couple of law schools and just wasn't working out. And I ended up getting a job in a large technology company in Austin, had multiple roles there and eventually landed as a graphic designer. It was kind of a meandering process, but it was at that one company where I got the role and I stuck with it. Okay. Your interests don't stop there because I know that uh, you and Cecilia are both uh, avid climbers, rock climbers, and you've gotten into photography. And I'm wondering, how did that all transpire? That's a good question. I, not, a, not a question I usually get a lot, but I guess we can, yeah, back up a little bit. So I met my wife in 2006. We, we met and, and we come to find out pretty quickly that we actually had the same similar acquaintances in, in the local climbing scene. Um, I had been climbing pretty regularly since graduating college in 1999. And it's something that's been a part of my life for, you know, up until now, really. And uh, I, may, I ended up making some of my closest friends. Uh, my, my wife, of course, climbed and uh, ended up falling into uh, work with, for a company, a local company in Austin called ClimbTech who produce and make uh, both fall protection and climbing gear. So, yeah, I mean, th this has been a big part of my life. A lot of my friends, my wife, uh, and I'm, yeah, published and wor work and do a lot of creative type work for a climbing company at, at, for a moment of time there. So... Uh, let's switch gears and talk about special needs first on a personal level and then beyond. And I'm sort of curious to know, how did the spina bifida diagnosis come about and what was your first reaction to it? The diagnosis came about while she was still in utero. It was a few months in. I think that day I was, I was working at the office. My Cecilia had to go in to, um, you know, for just a standard checkup. And then they asked her to come back either that day or the next day. And I, again, it was another day where I was at work and, you know, she, she came back when I got back home, this was maybe the day two, I think. And when I got back home, you know, she, she sat me down and she, she told me what the doctors had told her. So it was actually secondhand. And, um, so my reaction was, you know, you know, obviously it was, it's a really heavy diagnosis and, um, it definitely changed our outlook of, the pregnancy, I mean, it changed everything because we were now anticipating, you know, caring for, well, I had to learn. I mean, Cecilia kind of had a little better idea than I did, but I actually had to learn a little bit more about the diagnosis. And then, so it definitely changed um, the nature of the pregnancy from then on. Well, uh, from my own experience, um, the fact that you were having twins, you obviously knew you were having twins, that puts you in a high risk category just because there's more complications when there's two babies rolling around in there. Um, and then you get the further diagnosis that uh, one of them, you know, got this um, situation, right? They don't know the full extent of it. Um, and imagine you're just like your mind spinning, right? You know, into overdrive, trying to figure out, well, what is this? What are the different things that we need to be aware of? And how long ago before the actual birth um, did you guys have to contemplate or reflect on that? We had about... It's like easily five months. It was, you know, it was, it's quite a while. Oh, so really early on then. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was early. I mean, I, yeah, it, it, it definitely affected how we were looking at the pregnancy. And, you know, this was our, eventually our second and third child. And 
it, yeah, it, like you said, it was a high-risk birth, and it adds a lot of complications. So was it a regular delivery, or were there any complications around the delivery? How did it all transpire? It was it was a complicated delivery. Um, she ended up being in the hospital for a few days before the, the delivery, and because of the nature of the delivery, uh, it was going to be in the emergency wing of of delivery. It was a hard it was a hard few days, and then when it happened, it was almost like an emergency type medical response. So they shuffled her off into a room. There was at least three doctors, four doctors, uh, almost a dozen nurses of, uh, or, or support staff plus me. And it was a, it was a small room. So it, it was intense. It was something I, yeah, it's something that's going to be with me for the rest of my life, but it, it was, it was happy, but it was also very scary. Yeah. Well, I can only imagine, uh, you've got two babies coming out, Lalo, and then his sister, if it was in that order, uh, Adelina, and one is sort of, yeah. you know, healthy and the other one's, you know, got all this attention and need that needs to be, um, a top priority. And um, I'm wondering, did she spend very much time in the NICU or were you guys in the hospital for an extended period of time? Yeah. So the, the twins were considered preemies. They were about, you know, they came early, about two weeks early. And um, she actually ended up, uh, my daughter ended up having a pretty smooth birth. I mean, a- after it was all said and done, she did have to have uh, surgery the next day, I believe, on the spine. But all in all, it, it, we would have been out of the NICU a little sooner. It was our son that had uh, some, you know, just, I guess, jaundice type uh, complications, but we ended up just being in the NICU for about two to three weeks, I believe. Okay. But it was really it ended up being my, my son that <laughs> was the reason why they had to stay when it wasn't my daughter. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for sort of reviewing what the sort of entry to the world process was. And I'm wondering when did the seizures start to become noticeable um, and what type of seizures are they? Yes. So my uh, son Lalo actually uh, developed, I think he had his first fever related seizure around year one. It came as pretty big surprise. I've never experienced that and never have been around anybody who has experienced that. So it was a very new experience for us. Then that was it. It was like this one like odd occurrence of a seizure when he was about one. We didn't know if there was any underlying issues, so we weren't expecting that. And he did have some underlying issues that were related to like you know, just his general fussiness. But you know, at the time we didn't put two and two together. He would just ended up you know not sleeping that well and not feeding that great. For a period of time and so we didn't really put two and two together if, if they were related at all that was when he was about one again that was in austin we ended up moving from austin to olympia washington in 2013 with that came you know all the worries of getting our our daughter you know prepared for our life up here and finding the pro- appropriate therapies and doctors for her so you know scooting over to 2013 we're here in Olympia and, you know, our major concern really has been since this time up into 2013, our daughter and her care, you know, we're hearing for somebody with spina bifida and, and hydrocephalus. And then our son starts to develop these really odd, there's these really odd occurrences when we're here and he's having just strange, well, he's having seizures and it, I just didn't know what they were. We didn't know what they were. And they just started. They just started off small, and then they just started happening more more frequently, and that started to affect the small milestones he wasn't meeting. And then that's when we're starting to put two and two together, and and starting to take him to specialists to help us. Like you know, these seizures are are happening more frequently, and then sometimes they they kind of taper off, and and you won't see anything for a couple of days to so a few weeks, and then they start back up and. This went on for a few years when we're trying to just figure out, you know, what's going on. We were just trying to figure out what exactly is causing these. And, and while at the same time take, trying to care for our daughter. Um, but really, we didn't get our diagnosis or epilepsy diagnosis until a couple of years after he, his seizure started. Um, so I would say the la- uh, about 20, 2015, I think we got our official diagnosis. Okay. So... I'm sort of curious to know, when do the seizures start and what type of seizures are they? 
The seizure started um, when he was roughly around one years old, and we were living in Austin at the time. This first seizure was a febrile seizure, which is when you have a high temperature and I guess a sort of short seizure. And then we took him to the doctor, and but really it was kind of a standalone seizure that we just didn't think about. We didn't think too much about. We moved from Austin to Olympia in 2013. Before that, now that I'm remembering, I mean, we did have some just, again, feeding and, and sleep issues and whatnot, but we just, we didn't, we weren't connecting the dots necessarily. Let's skip over to moving to Olympia in 2013. His seizures just started to progress and he was having different types. Um, it, it, it was getting a little more scarier and, and we had no answer for anything. We were, our concentration was on our daughter and, and, and taking care of her needs. We really had no idea that there was going to be another neurological disorder, essentially, in our family that we would have to take care of. So they developed and and to the point where when we were here in Olympia, the first couple of years were pretty hard because he was having multiple types of seizures. And, and we finally started to see neurologists and, and different specialists and it was a year or two later that we got the final diagnosis that he, you know, he, he had developed epilepsy, which is, you know, what happens. You can, you can actually develop epilepsy, which is, I, I, I didn't, I didn't know that at the time. Um, but that's how, that's how it kind of unfolded for us. And, but he is on medication. Uh, the form of epilepsy that he has is called intractable epilepsy, which is kind of a seizures that just can't be controlled by medicines, but we do have success with some medicines. It's just, they don't tend to last very long. You know, it, it's it's just something that we're learning to live with. Well, thanks for sharing. It sounds like a pretty challenging situation, having a daughter with known special needs with spina bifida, and then, you know, having your son experience these seizures, which is not one and done, like you were saying, with a febrile seizure, but, you know, something that's been evolving. So um, my heart reaches out to you and Cecilia. It sounds like you have your hands full. So I'm sort of curious to know, as a relatively young father, you know, what type of uh, concerns or fears have you had um, as the situation has uh, evolved? Well, I mean, taking the pandemic out of it for now, I mean, the the fears, you know, I, I have, you know, have always kind of been associated with the milestones. This comes up in the podcast I've been listening to in some of your interviews, and I'm hearing it with other dads, and it's just when your child starts missing their milestones, that's when the red flags start to pop up. And with Lalo, it was, yeah, it was, it's happened really early. So he's not able to learn at the same pace as any other kid, you know, like any other kid, like he's one of those kids just, just does he learns at, at this other pace. And then when the seizures start to unfold, you know, you'll see these huge regressions in speech and motor and, walking. I mean, that was a whole other thing. Uh, so it, it affects everything. So then your fear turns into this whole thing of like, geez, you know, I, I just want him to learn like how to, how to talk with me. And so then your fear just becomes like making it to the next day. And, and are we going to make it and kind of get that kind of doom fear thinking that starts to creep in, which is, I, you know, I'm starting to find out it's pretty normal, but I mean, that's, that's what the fear was. You're just like, please, let's just I just want him to be able to have a day, a seizure-free day and and go outside and we can all just have just that normalcy that you kind of see. That's where a lot of my fear came from, you know. Are we going to be able to get to that point where we can have that those normal days and go out and just hold hands and just walk to the ice cream store and get some ice creams in? Well, it sounds very real. Thank you for sharing. And I'm wondering if there's any meaningful advice you've gotten along the way about the spina bifida diagnosis for Adelina or the seizure control? Is there any advice that you can look back um, over the last few years and say, oh, this was really instrumental? For me personally, it wasn't so much one piece of advice because, you know, we both my wife and I have been doing this, you know, up here on, on our own, but luckily her in-law, my in-laws moved up here not, not too long after we did, and they were able to be a really good support system for us. But it was really until 2017 when I attended my first Fathers Network 
conference here in Washington. And that was the first time I actually got to see other dads who cared for children with special needs. And that was the first time I actually got to maybe have a little more context for my own situation. It wasn't so much like, again, one piece of advice, but my big takeaway from that first conference was that I was maybe beating myself up too much. I got, I fell into that category of, of special needs dad who jumps into his work and, and just concentrate on just working as, as much as you know you can and, and just forget about everything else. But when I went to that conference, I really felt like I needed to slow down and breathe a little bit. Yeah, well, thanks for mentioning that. Uh, it is instrumental to be able to put your situation in perspective and know that you're not alone, even though it seems very lonely and isolating to be um, shouldering the challenges that you've described. And I think you can look at things a little bit more objectively, you know, when you're in the presence of other individuals, uh, particularly those who've had a lot more years of experience than you. Um, so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the Washington State Fathers Network. But um, I'm wondering, is there any decision or series of decisions that you've made the last handful of years since you've been in Olympia on behalf of one or both of the kids to help them make the progress that they have? I would say the decisions just keep on coming. Like they just, I, I, we, we just had to make some big ones this week and it's been constant. I mean, when the pandemic hit, for instance, my daughter had to go in for emergency surgery and, you know, that was a big decision and that we're also trying to care for our son. You know, he, had, his epilepsy has kind of spiked these last, well, this last 12 months actually. And especially these last few months. So since the summer, you know, if I was going to pick one, I would probably go and say just making sure that they were a part and are a part of the community and the school system here and making sure that we are continually trying to make sure that their all their needs are met on it. And it's an everyday kind of not battle because I don't want to say like I'm, we're attacking anybody, but it's just one of those things where you just it's a constant thing. I wish I could tell you. I I think a lot a lot of this comes down to you because because you're talking to somebody with two kids with special needs, it's hard for me to like grapple down sometimes what is more important than the other. You know, that's that's a constant struggle that I have in my head all the time, you know. Is is was one is one child's diagnosis more important than the others? Is is this it seems like every decision we make is is um pretty important. Yeah, well, um it sort of begs the other question that I had which is what have been some of your greatest challenges and what you're articulating is that, you know, you've got to pick and choose, you know, between where to divert your time and your limited energy, right? You know, each of us has a bandwidth and, you know, at some point, you know, you've only got so much and, you know, you did make reference to uh, the schooling, right? They're relatively young, right? They would be in like second or third grade, you know, chronologically. And are they be able up until the pandemic, were they mainstreamed or did you have to seek out uh, special education type services? Yeah, for on one end, it was, it was kind of really easy with our daughter because, you know, now she's, mo you know, she's mobile for the most part and she can uh, get herself from point A to point B and she can communicate in a clear way and she, you know, she can articulate what she wants and, and how she wants it. And then you have our son who has a lot of needs. And so there was a time there a few years ago where I was actually driving him from one school for a couple of hours, picking him up and then driving to another school to get additional services. And services has always been a kind of a ongoing negotiation for us in the school. So yeah, so he, he required an extra amount of driving around to this school or that therapy. And that was one of the main challenges, um, especially when they were a little younger and and not quite able to, you know, put on their backpack and put their laptop in their bag. So that was definitely a challenging point. But really the, the main challenge would be the speed at which they are developing and, and hitting their milestones. Being at the same age, but being on a completely different, um, almost like a grade. Yeah, like having twins, but they're not, they're not really at the same level. Yeah, well, it sounds like you've had to adjust your expectations, right, based on where they're at chronologically and then in their physical, emotional development as well. And uh, it sounds like a never-ending challenge like you've outlined. Um, 
I'm sort of curious to know what impact uh, Adelina's and Lalo's situations have had on their older brother, Emil, uh, your marriage or the rest of their, your family, the extended family for that matter. I don't know necessarily what it, what it would be like to be his age and going through it, this, um, but he's been a really good trooper. I mean, it hasn't been easy for him, but he has been a, a, a really strong big brother to both Adelina and, and Lalo. And there was a time there, you know, he actually shared a room with Lalo. Lalo had a, a night seizure. Emil got really good at, at hearing them uh, before we got some of the more advanced stuff we have now in his bedroom to help us out. Emil has gotten used to being around some special new kids. At the same time, it's kind of been interesting interesting to see him develop because he doesn't see their needs the same way that other people do. So he sees them with a, you know fresh eyes for the most part. And so sometimes you kind of have to reel them back. Like, hey, listen, you can't be rough with your brother and sister. And he's like, why not? You know? <laughs> you kind of have to remind him sometimes you know you, you really can't like throw any any even if it's a pillow don't throw anything at your sister's head please she has she has a shunt you know please don't do that things like that you know when it comes to a meal like i i've been trying to be more conscious of making sure that he he can be a regular normal brother to his sister and his brother but you know we've had our challenges but he's been a good kid with our marriage you know obviously you know it's been challenging but Honestly, I like to think of us in some ways as climbers, you know, we're, we're, it feels like we're on this big multi-pitch long climb and some of the pitches I've short roped her and <laughs> <laughs> not to get into, not, not to be too funny about, it, but yeah, no, there's been challenges, but for the most part, we really are trying our best to concentrate on caring for our children. And, and when you have something like that in front of you, it makes it easy to both like be super alert and ready to take care of the day and also, you know, having a challenging time spending time with your wife. So we, we've been trying to, that balance has been a part of our journey too and making sure that we find time for each other and making sure that, you know, we, a year or so ago, we, we were doing dance lessons, you know, for a bit uh, or something like that, you know, and, and still trying to insert that kind of stuff into our life and trying to do date nights and whatnot. So, and then the extended family, we actually moved up here to Olympia on our own. And then a couple of years, I think I said earlier that a couple of years later, our in-laws ended up moving up here to help out and whatnot. But for the most part, we've kind of been up here on our own and, and taking care of ourselves and our family first. And, and we're well aware that we're, you know, I'm, I'm from Texas and, and my, all my family's from Texas. So I'm not really kidding myself that, you know, I wasn't really expecting people to immediately jump on planes any, any chance they, they got. So I kind of have a healthy level of, of expectation too. So, you know, it's, it's really kind of just us up here. So let's talk about supporting organizations. Uh, you mentioned one, the Washington State Fathers Network. And I'm wondering if you could uh, tell our listeners a little bit more about that organization and uh, what your experience has been. Yeah. So again, um, Really, my first experience was that uh, Fathers Network conference that I had. I went to, in, I think, 2017. And actually, again, to go back to my lovely wife, she was the one that actually prodded me to go. Uh, I didn't want to go, and I went, and it really kind of, again, opened my eyes and gave me a little, a little more context and, and actually just seeing fathers there going through the same experience I was or I am. At, at the time, we didn't have a Fathers Network affiliate here in Olympia. So I actually went completely by myself. If if it, if anything else, I was probably just scared to go by myself to a special needs fathers conference. But it really changed my outlook. It gave me some better perspective. What they do is honestly provide some resources, links to other um, blogs, uh, signing up for newsletters. There's chapters, so the chapters meet on their own, and then there's events that they have. The other group that we're kind of involved with is here locally in Olympia. It's called South Sound Parent to Parent. And it's more focused on, you know, getting locally parents to resources more, more directly here in, in Olympia. And that was really important to us. That's how we got our children into the Birth to Three program and some other resources. And, and that, those were the events that we actually were able to go to, like little events, like a little 
special needs happy hour for parents or a Christmas get together. They would organize these events locally. Uh, and those were always fun. So if anything, I, I would say both South Sound Parent to Parent and the Washington State Fathers Network are probably my, my go-to networks now. And then for the last year or so, a little longer than a year, the South Sound Parent to Parent has actually started essentially a, not really a chapter, but we've started our own group that's sort of connected to the Fathers Network. So for the last year, I've been um, yeah, essentially attending um, a local weekly Fathers Network. Um, now it's a Zoom, but a meeting. And that's been super helpful for me as a dad, but also keeping me in touch with local resources that I, that, you know, like sports game or a, an event just for special needs families. Um, that's been kind of our key to getting into the community here. I heard it said before, but, and it maybe it was a children's book that I probably read a few, few too many times, but where you have to fill your bucket and you have to fill other people's bucket with kindness and just kind of continuously filling the bucket and making sure that you show up and are present and are doing the work. So let's give a special shout out to our mutual friend, Luis Mendoza of the Washington State Fathers Network for helping connect us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you uh, for Lewis and, and definitely for the Fathers Network. If there's any takeaway here, because, you know, you have a lot of accomplished interviewees and, and I feel like, you know, I didn't really have anything to offer other than to point people to a website, but it's a really good website and it, there's a lot there, especially if you're in the, in the Washington region. Excellent. So is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? Um, no, that's it. I just want to say uh, thank you for having me. This has been really fulfilling, actually. I really appreciate the conversation and your questions and whatnot. I hope I didn't ramble too much, but I also want to thank really my local uh, South Sound parent to parent fathers group. Those guys have been great this last year, and I'm going to keep on continuing to do that. Yeah, well, thanks for mentioning that. If somebody wants to learn more about the South Sound parent to parent network, the Washington State Fathers Network, or just contact you, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, I mean, it feel free to contact me on my email is smile at fellymonphoto.com. But honestly, reach out to the um, organizations directly uh, would be the best bet, honestly. But if you have any questions regarding anything I talked about today, feel free to email me directly. Excellent. Felmon, thank you for taking the time and many insights. As a reminder, Felmon is just one of the dads who's part of the Special Fathers Network, a mentoring program for fathers raising a child with special needs. If you'd like to be a mentor father or are seeking advice from a mentor father with a similar situation to your own, please go to 21stCenturyDads.org. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As you probably know, the 21st Century Dads Foundation is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, which means we need your help to keep our content free to all concerned. Would you please consider making a tax deductible contribution? I would really appreciate your support. Balaman, thanks again. Thank you, David. And thank you for listening to the Dad to Dad podcast presented by the Special Fathers Network. The Special Fathers Network is a dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children connect with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for fathers to support fathers. Go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we would be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group. Please go to Facebook.com groups and search Dad to Dad. Also, please be sure to register for the Special Fathers Network bi-weekly Zoom calls held on the first and third Tuesdays of every month. Lastly, we're always looking to share interesting stories. If you'd like to share your story or know of a compelling story, please send an email to david at 21stCenturyDads.org. The Dad to Dad podcast was produced by Couch Audio for the Special Fathers Network. Thanks again to Horizon Therapeutics, who believe that science and compassion must work together to transform lives. That's why they work tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. 
Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics at horizontherapeutics.com.